to first acknowledge um, that today we are learning, speaking, and gathering on the ancestral homelands of the Mohican people, who are the Indigenous people of this land. Despite tremendous hardship in being forced from here, today their community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie community. And they do have an office down on Spring Street, Spring Street in Williamstown. We pay honor and respect to their ancestors, past and present, as we commit to building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. So um, for those of you who haven't been to Sheep Hill for, before, I'm not sure if Robin already explained this, but restrooms are over there and there's food here available as well. Um, so welcome to our third conversation for the Knowing Your Landscape series. This series is a kind of brainchild of our Working Hands, Working Land series and our Talks on the Hill series. Um, and we're hoping to focus on providing information to landowners in order to help you make land stewardship decisions. Um, so for those of you joining online, I hope that you can hear me now. Um, we'll be, uh, if you look down on the bottom of your toolbar, you have a Q&A feature. You're welcome to raise your hand or type anything into the Q&A at any time. Um, but Rennie will be answering questions at the end of the presentation. And that goes for everyone here in the audience as well. Um, please note that um, this record, this whole conversation talk will be posted on YouTube afterwards as well. Um, so tonight we're discussing invasive species. I'm sure you've seen them around town. I'm sure you see them around the room um, and as well as on your own land. And hopefully tonight you'll be able to walk away with a better idea of what those invasive species are and why it's important to pay attention to them as well as kind of getting a beginning of a strategy of how to manage them. So Rennie Wendell is our speaker tonight. Um, he has been a professional naturalist and birding expert in the Berkshires for over 20 years, and he currently serves as a land steward with the Nature Conservancy. So, okay. um, and thank you for choosing me. I know you had the President's State of the Union address to choose from. Um, so. Yeah, thank you for that. That's what you do also. Yeah, right. Yeah, so Robin was great enough to go out here and pick some invasive species for us. Um, so when I say really detecting invasive species, there's two ways I think about it. Some of these species here have been with us for decades and decades. It's really detection if you're lucky enough to be up in Peru and there's no other invasive species and there's only a, a one or two barberry bushes coming in or you find the first honeysuckle on your property. That's early detection. But what I want to talk to you guys about tonight specifically um, is newcomers to our area on the horizon. And I work at, with the Nature Conservancy down in Sheffield. I've been with them eight years. Uh, before that, I worked at Bartholomew's Cobble. I ran that place for 13 years. I worked there and then ran it. I was there for 13 years. So I've been doing it over 20 years. I graduated BCC and, and MCLA, so I'm a homegrown guy. Um, but in South County, we're drowning in invasive species, right? So I have, you know, we're usually the, you know, the, the first incursions come down that way. So I gave this talk in October, I think, is that where you saw me, Dana? Were yep. you there at the Berkshire Natural Histories Conference? So I apologize if you've already gone to that. It's the exact same talk. So, you know, repetition is the key to learning, right? So you'll get hammered with it twice. Um, so early detection species. Running with the free, do you want to just un, um, do the camera? Um, Undo the camera. Oh, start video? Yeah, that one. Got it. <laughs> Cannot start your video because the host has not stopped it. All right, never mind. All right. <laughs> Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Awesome. So, yeah, Sheffield. So a lot of these, a lot of these plants are down in Sheffield. Some of them are just popping into your area. Um, my years of working with the trustees, I know Julie Richburg, the ecologist with the trustees up at Field Farm and places. So I'm just gonna go through, I picked five species to talk with you guys about tonight. All right, see if it goes. Oh. All right, you guys heard about Hardy Kiwi yet? All right, so Berkshire, um, Berkshire Environment Action Team and Audubon and stuff are struggling with this plant. So hardy kiwi. We have it up here yet? Yeah. We do. That's right oh, there. Williamstown. So hardy kiwi. So this. That's Williamstown. Yep. 
So you want to, uh, William Stone, yes, I am a horrible scholar. And I'm sure you can find, you can find plenty in here. Um, but it's a nasty woody vine similar to Oriental bittersweet. Um, it came in the 1800s and it was planted around a lot of um, our big Berkshire estates back in the day. They believe in Kennedy Park was one of the first places and that old big hotel that was up there that burnt down. And, um, you know, it behaved for 100 years, you know, 60, 70 years. And a lot of these invasives will do that. They'll behave up until the point where they don't behave. And then if somebody finds a way to pollinate and then the seeds are everywhere. So it's coming into our area. Um, it's on the horizon. So different places, Williams, Williamstown, I, I know the spot in Williamstown where it was removed and that's from Julie Richburg up at Field Farm um, in Sheffield. I took the one population that I know of. This, when you see this, this is not comprehensive. If you guys know of any other locations, please feel free to talk to me. I would love to discuss how we can, you know, all work together. It's going to be a big team effort to get rid of some of this stuff. So here's a, a list of where they say it is on GoBotany. All right, and GoBotany is, you know, this is a platform where you enter your own ass. So it's not, it's not, maybe might not be totally comprehensive, but you get a sense, right? So we're talking about, an invasive that we can do something about as a community, as a, as a county, part of Kiwi is that. Take a look at this. If that was Oriental bittersweet, everything would be lit up, right? Yeah. So where do you focus your efforts? So that's where the Nature Conservancy, where we focus our efforts in an invasive plant uh, control is in areas with early detection, maybe it's barberry, because I'm gonna get a, some work up in middle field in the coming years on some some, uh, some um, Japanese knotweed that's just coming in at Glendale mm -hmm. Brook. Yeah. But in South County, I focus on these new incursions of new things that we can probably stop from becoming the next Oriental bittersweet, the next Japanese barberry, right? So that's why I want to tell everybody, that's why when I was invited here by Dana, I jumped at the opportunity. Um, so, I don't care how you want to kill it, you know, if, if you don't like herbicide, that's fine. Jane it, it, it up in, uh, uh, see what was, Jane up at Burbank Park is doing it all by hand. God bless her. That's a lot of work. Um, any way you can would be the way. And I'll ask you if you want to talk to me about eradication means afterwards, but check it out. Like we are, it was planted around these giant Berkshire homes. Oh, I hate this plant. For fruit or ornament? Um, probably both, you know, back in the day. Oh, this is something we don't have, mm -hmm. you know. And then they you can get the little hardy kiwis, you can get them kiwi berries. Mm -hmm. They're called in stores if you see them. That's that's mm -hmm. hardy kiwi fruit. Does it fruit here? It does. Okay. So um it wasn't fruiting oh. up until it did start fruit. Oh, so you know they they behave lots of times. And I'll talk to you about my Sheffield property. Uh, the Sheffield one was eradicated in Sheffield. And it was by this farmer who was sold this plant as a way to augment the slow food movement, small agriculture as another crop, mm -hmm. right? Another kitschy crop that you could sell. And they do well here. That's you saw mm -hmm. how it's... Uh, so um, he's on one of our conservation easements and I learned about this plant. So it took me like five years and I drove by and I'm like, oh my God. Uh, actually, it was my boss that saw it. She, she saw it first and we went over and, and I talked to him and he's like, I can't get rid of that. And this, so I'm like, all right. So then I educated him and I said my words, like I always said, you know, you have the opportunity right now to stop the first infestation in Sheffield. Imagine if you could go back in time and get rid of the first Oriental bittersweet. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is in your hands right now. I mean, it's your property. I can't, you know, I'm, I mean, I contemplated coming in at night with a little lobbers, but I'm not. <laughs> um, but it took a long time. And then at the end of five years, the last year, he's like, he didn't get to pick his fruit. And all the birds came in. Oh. And then he realized 
that you know birds do what birds do. <laughs> so um, and then so all the plants like in this room, like honeysuckle and, and rose that Robin picked for us, they're on the invasive plant antler, atlas in New England. You can't buy them anymore in nurseries um, because they've been proven to be uh, invasive. Okay, great. I mean, at least that's helping people not buy them and then move them up into Peru or Savoy, right? Williamstown, you're close to agriculture. You got all these things. We like a lot like Sheffield. But this is the one you want to say is outlawed, but there's this whole movement in the farming community and propagators that don't want to list this one as an invasive species. Unfortunately, by the time you're seeing it as an invasive in your backyard everywhere, probably when it'll be listed. Mm -hmm. So I just want to say, if you have it, if you know where it is, consider getting rid of it. It's, it's a horrible, horrible plant. All right, and this is a little video. Is this going to play? Oh, I remember this from the conference. Yeah. You won't get my, my voice, but I'll narrate this. That's all hardy kiwi. See that right there? It looks like oriental bittersweet. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's all hardy kiwi on the backside of Woods Pond going up to October Mountain mm -hmm. in Lee. So if you think about it being planted at an old historic house site, there's no historic house in the backside of Woods Pond. You know, that's that's obviously spread by, by, by uh, deep dispersal. And I mean, let me play it again for you. Let me, let me go back. So you talk about invasive species, right? Look at these leaves. Those are all nice and fresh, right? Mm. Nothing's eaten mm. those plants, right? So, I mean, I, you guys must know the why they're bad, right? I'll tell you anyway, because I like to talk <laughs> about this stuff, right? So everywhere where this plant is, there's no trees coming up through here. So you got no tree regeneration. There's no trilliums underneath there. There's no uh, goldenrods or asters. There's nothing of any value to wildlife in there. So you think about the insect apocalypse. You've heard about this, how we've <laughs> lost almost 50% of the amount of insects we used to have the numbers. Or that's birds. Right? Same way, right? yeah, birds and the insect apocalypse, right? No, that's the problem with invasive species is nothing eats them. So there's no insects in this area eating any of this plant. Whereas if it was trees and trilliums and goldenrods and asters, you'd have all sorts of insects. Mm -hmm. Now talk about the birds, right? So the birds, every bird eats insects including hummingbirds, which feed their little babies insects. So there's no insects, eat, there's no plants, native plants. There's no insects in here eating the native plants. There's no birds. So it's this cascading effect. And talk about like, when you look out in the wetland that's, you know, 20 acres phragmites, and then you got nothing of value out of there. So it, this is why it's, it's, it's bad. Okay, so here's. Oh, you guys know this one? I know it. Do you have it yet? From Jersey. All right. This, I'm getting goosebumps. Oh, All right. <laughs> Japanese stillgrass. We're drowning in it up in Mount Washington. Oh. All right. So, Mount Washington, it came into Mount Washington on logging trucks. All right. And then a logger from Mount Washington came to Sheffield and logged one of our conservation easements. And it's all now in our conservation. Oh. All right, so it's in Sheffield, Egremont, and um, and uh, Mount Washington. All right. So it's a grass. You guys know how hard it is to kill the grass, right? The plants right here. I used to when I first started this, I used to think they were horrible plants. Honey suckle. These are oh, dang. They die easy. <laughs> all right. If you find this plant. Give it everything you got in Williamstown. All right. Everything. Throw everything at it. Stop what you're doing. Get rid of this plant as quick as you can because Mount Washington wishes they were you right now. Oh. It is in every single road there. And then it gets into the drainage, into mm -hmm. the seeds down into the brooks, and it goes into uh, Gilda Brook and then Carner Brook. And Carner Brook is the watershed for Egermont. So then it gets into, oh, let me see. All right. And then I think it came in the 1900s, packed in porcelain. So it takes a long time for some of these, these, these plants to finally 
get the exponential growth. Remember when you just one year, you're like, where the hell did all this garlic mustard come from? <laughs> right. So one garlic mustard makes, you know, hundred seeds, 50% are viable, 25 last in the year. Right. I don't know if this is true, but this is close. Right. So you got one garlic mustard makes 25, 25 makes another 25 that, you know what I mean? It's just, so that's how it happens. Um, Japanese still grass is incredibly hard to control. But if you do find it, this is where it is right now. Nobody's reported it in Sheffield. That's a mistake, but it's coming. Mm. And it's right off to your um, your east up there in Vermont as well. Oh. It's, a, uh, it's a really co cool looking little grass. It was also sold. Um, it was, it's also sold by the nursery trade as you can plant underneath trees because it tolerates shade. Um, it has stilts to prop itself up. And then it has this mid vein right there. So if you think you got it, you can snap a picture. You can send it to me. I'll try to identify it if you can. If you can. I can. So this is what it does. All right, that's the middle of the roadside. So it penetrates into forests when the sunlight is able to penetrate through. So uh, this is uh, obviously a woods road. So this is a grass, nothing's eating it, including deer. All right, so now there's no native grasses, no native plants to grow here, nothing to feed the deer. So now we have a deer population of birchers that is bigger than it ever has been in the history of the planet. We have more deer and birchers than we ever had before. All right, now because invasive species, they're pushing our native plants out, more deer are focusing on our native plants. So it's a double whammy for our native species. I'm sorry if this is bumming you out. I mean, maybe you want to listen to this. <laughs> 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 okay, so, that's a little bit about the plants that we have. That's a good one. But yeah, so Japanese still grass. So keep an eye out for this one. If you think you got it, um, I will do, like you said, if you guys want me to come back and do it, that's all. Oh, Dana's already spoken to me. I'll show you some of the regular stuff that we have, so you won't see this. But if you guys wanted to come down to South County, if anyone was uber interested, I could give you the early detection tour. We're going to have to wear shoe covers. Right. So, <laughs> all right. So I will play this video as well. So uh, what I'm narrating in this video is Japanese stilt grass right here, right? This is in Salisbury, Connecticut, right over the border from Sheffield. Mm -hmm. You see what it's doing here? What time of the so year is this? This is July, August. So what happened was we got a rich landowner down there. He's got a bunch of means. And he has all these wood roads going through his property. And he had to blow down. He had this big blow down. I bet they knocked a bunch of ash trees down. So his guys went in there with their four-wheelers the wrong time of year when the seeds are going oh. and just dragged all this stuff in here. Oh. And now it's open can because the trees came down. It was a weather event. It was probably you know, some wind shear or something took all these trees down. And now he's, he's like, what do I do? Oh, and I I do. Cry. What, um, did, what, did what could he do? Um, the only thing I found to work on uh, Japanese stilt grass is herbicide. I was mowing it when I first started with the Nature Conservancy. We were trying to mow it and we held a lot of ground. And maybe had maybe a slight increase, but mowing it was working. What we found is grass does what grass does, right? When you mow your grass on your lawn, it doesn't die, right? So what it was doing was it wasn't it wasn't growing this high like in the video. It was growing this high and then seeding. Oh shoot! Do you know what I mean? Like the grass is so wow. Like if I want to come back as anything and survive, come back as yeah. grass. Yeah, it's crazy, right? So. He's looking at a multi-year, probably uh, herbicide, 1% uh, herbicide treatment. <clears throat> yep. But my point of coming to you guys is yeah. don't let this come to you guys. Okay. You know what I mean? If you, if you think you got it or you're like, you know, that Joe says that's what that is. Maybe I have to contact Remy. And then if you this, I don't know how long it's been in there. You know, that's obviously a multi-year thing. He's, his seed bank is just drowning in the seeds now. So, but even if you have it here and it's gone undetected for three years, 
you know, you can do something. Yeah. Well, and also I the herbicide have on the seed. Uh, it doesn't. It just, it's, it's a foliar application, so <laughs> the plant takes it in through its leaf. So if you've got generations of seeds, it's a progress. You got to keep going back and back, right? And then you can't miss a year because then the ones through it's it's a lot of work. Do they have a but, focus herbicide? So well, I hope it's it's a, yes. I, I use uh, the uh, glyphosate. So you guys know it is Roundup. It's a it's a one percent solution, so very late percent. But um, yeah. What was I gonna say? Yeah. Well, the management approach is to just be real careful who comes on the land. Or so you if you find it early, you hand pick. Yes, yes, yes. If yes. Hand picking is great, but you ain't hand picking that. <laughs> <laughs> so you know what I mean. And um, so I so there's I walk. We have a couple of trails down there, and I walk the trails. And trails are a huge vector. And um, I find little patches, and I hand pull it. Yeah. So yeah. You have to eat the seed or something. You got anybody know this one? Yeah. Swallowwort's yeah. a nasty one. Yeah. Um, this one's probably been here longer than the other ones I've ever spoken about. But it's worth noting if you have it to, to throw everything at you, you can add it too. Um, if you don't know it, I don't know it. It's in the milkweed family. And it's found plenty of places. This probably this is obviously not a comprehensive list. But the seeds wind diverse, dispersed, mm -hmm. right? And um, there's oh. Gobotany. Is it I, This isn't. It's it's a vine. Ah. See the vine is a twining vine, but this is when the vine goes nuts. Oh. And see those little milkweed feather things. So this is at, in the milkweed family. Um, there's some conjecture on how much it is a sink for monarch butterflies. It has been known the monarch lays their eggs on it, but not as much as they used to think, but still a bad plant. Um, if a monarch were to use this to lay its eggs, it would, the caterpillars aren't designed to eat it. Oh. You know, insects and plants, I mean, that's the problem, that's the problem right? Is they co evolve right? So our milkweed makes a defense, monarch finds out a way to get around it, and this is like an ever battle, right? We come from Asia, Plank, and none of our insects are designed to eat it. So that's well, where the disconnect does. is. The monarch, yeah, the, the caterpillars will not be able to survive. Yeah. But it doesn't happen as much. I used to think it happened a lot more, but I've been doing more research. And, so I don't want to misquote. I'm on YouTube for, oh, okay. for crying out loud. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not an expert. It's just all my personal experience. Like these are all plants oh. I fight. This is, and these are all my photos. So, I mean, except for this one. Um, the one slide. <laughs> right here. Um, so I'm talking from personal experience on these plants. Um, okay, this is the one I've been doing outside too. All right. Okay. All right. So that's swallower. This is why I went to the Berkshire Natural Resources uh, the History Conference, right? Because of this plant. Three years ago, I'm driving by the same farmer's property that had the um the hardy kiwi. And I look, it happens to be May, and I look, this is a vernal pool. Oh, and then, then there's a stone wall back here you can't see, and then it's Nature Conservancy property. And I'm like, what the heck am I looking at? Yeah. So I take a photo and I send it out to my botanist friends, Julie Richford, one of them. And she writes back, she goes, wow, that's Japanese primrose. I had that up in Williamstown. Yeah. Field Farm. <laughs> So, this thing has more seeds. Oh. I don't even know. So, so, what it does is it, it's absolutely stunning plant. It's gorgeous, right? But what it does, it makes these big basil leaves, covers everything else, right? Then it makes a tear, flowers, and then every one of these little, these little seed pods has a zillion seeds in it. Um, so, I started screaming from the rooftops about this plant. This is my plant. This is the one I've been saying we all need to watch out. You're not going to see this in eye pain. You're not going to see it anywhere else. This is me telling you it's super bad. And I'm really worried about this one, especially in Sheffield, because you guys have some nice mountains up here. We're a swamp. Mm -hmm. Sheffield swamp land in Mosquitoville. Stay up here if you don't like mosquitoes. Yeah. Um, but I protect... 
probably the most ecologically diverse property in Massachusetts, Schnapp Brook. If you look at, um, you know, the biomap, the core habitats and rare species habitats, there's two places in Massachusetts that get lit up. It's Cape Cod and then it's Sheffield. <laughs> and Sheffield, it's just chock-a-block because of our soils with rare and unusual species. Unfortunately, we're post-agriculture, so a ton of invasive species. The soil is great. We have a lot of wealthy landowners that like their gardens. Like we are just a hotbed for this stuff. So if this thing gets into Schnapp Road, which is this giant, you know, swamp with rare orchids. Mm -hmm. So this is why I actually asked Tom Kynan to speak at the Virgin Natural History Conference. This is where you guys found me because of this plant. Um, and when I was there at the conference, this young, this young woman was like, oh my God, I've been telling my grandmother this is horrible for years. Yeah. And yeah, so if you have this, um, I have now since found it on another uh, one of our conservation easements. Mm -hmm. And um, I've convinced the landowners to let me treat it. It pulls out really easy. So mm -hmm. if you're a herbicide adverse, you can just grab it. The point, it comes right out. It's super easy. I know it's a tough sell when you see this beautiful. It's like, look, wow, look at these things. Yeah. It's they're like purple, pinks, mm -hmm. whites. This is probably in, 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 in a place in a swampland where people, you know, like if you're a gardener, like how what do I plant in there? You know, so right, right. this is yeah. And then um, I think I don't know if it's Alana, but one of the big estates in Hudson is selling this in their gift shop. Yes. So I tried to contact them to have them stop selling it, but no. We can all contact them. them. I, I don't know if it's Alana. If it's not Alana, I'm sorry. One of you guys over there. I gotta forget. I'm, I gotta forget. I'm on YouTube. <laughs> It's um regularly available in um, yes. nursery. Yes, I contacted Greg Ward down at uh, Great Barrington mm -hmm. and he, he was he was selling it and he stopped. Which well where I, I mean I, I come from the Boston area, that's where I yeah. go. Um and, and yeah, you can order it from like White Flower Farm and sure. Stuff. Um, and the problem is is like by the time you realize you're looking at 300 right. garlic mustard plants, the cat's out of the bag. Right. Like now you're fighting almost a losing battle. Mount Washington and they're still grass. God bless them. Like, you know, but but this one I think we could get. So if you if you pull these, yep. Can you can you burn them? What what can you do? Oh, these are great ones. So when they're flowering, they're not like garlic mustard. You know, if you pull garlic mustard, it's like I, mean, I want to come back as a garlic mustard. Like you pull it off and it, the root is exposed, and then the head goes like this and continues to flower. Yeah, and then sets seed. It's crazy. This one, you just pull it and dies. It, it, it's, it's, it's not the same thing, thing as, as um, the Bulgarian, um, correct? No, this is the Japanese primrose. This, the West. this one comes up. Yeah, it's not right. evening primrose or anything like that. No. Not to be confused. But the tricky thing about managing this is you got it's in a wetland. And so you got your conservation commission right on top of you, ready to arrest you for stepping foot in your wetland. Mm -hmm. So we're looking forward to knowing what to do about that. I had to get permits um, because mm -hmm. this is all in our schnapp I had to get an NOI and stuff like that. Right. But this is if this is in your garden and you're rid of it. All right. You know, but if it's in your your local mm -hmm. conservation land, you might want to contact somebody mm -hmm. and then. Okay. But um, this would be really good, like. You know, the first bright mighty said to come from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. The first multi-floor roses, they were given out by the government yeah. for a living hedge, you know? Mm -hmm. These things, like, we're, this is the front line. These, these plants, right. yeah, yeah. Right. so please consider if you have it to get rid of it or to tell your neighbor to, but be nice, you know? People aren't mean. People just want a pretty plant, oh. you know what I mean? So even my, even my buddy, the farmer, I'm like, dude, you got to get rid of it, man. You know, he, he wasn't malicious, you know. So. <laughs> um, Backwaters. Still sold. It's not an eye pain yet. Very happy in the shade. Yeah. And most of these are intentional plantings in the Berkshires. But what happens is, and it spreads. So this one spot, not at the farmers, because that was a contained vernal pool. But the next spot I found it for 
was a drainage that led, mm -hmm. led right to Schnapp Brook. Mm -hmm. And I got like, I was 10 feet from where it drained into Schnapp. So I don't know. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, that's it. Yeah. Bill Botany. So another plant, I mean, obviously mm -hmm. underreported, you know, people, if you don't know it's bad, you don't know, right? Looks like Dan's Rocket. I was going to say the same thing. It does look like Dan's Rocket. This is a basal leaf. If you go back, giant basal leaves, those leaves are like this big. Mm -hmm. It's a very pretty plant, though. Oh, a lot of people have it in their garden. It's, well, it's, it's amazing. It's going to go bye bye. Yeah. 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 This is summary right for those people. So there it is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then this is early in the season. So it'll come up, point, then it'll go, point. And it'll be about this high, and it'll have three or four worlds. Oh, oh, it keeps going. And it keeps on going. And it just, I, do I have a picture of the seeds? No, no. That's another one. Yes. So, yeah, you can see this one's kind of doing it, right? Yep, yep. Well, this is just knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> this is one that's, um, I'm ending on a success story. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because this is a depressing talk, and I'm sorry there's <laughs> cheese. <laughs> Make yourself feel better. Um, the chocolate vine, five leaf dekevia. Um, so I found that, well, I didn't find this. When I first started with the Nature Conservancy, my boss, Angela, she told me about it, and I'm like, well, I've never heard of this. And I'm like, eh, this is, right. this is obviously just spreading. It's just, Planted in an old house site. It was, there's a you know there's a cellar hole, so it was planted. Blah blah blah. And then I went to a place in Canaan. I was just it's like a, a rundown house that a bunch of streams. So I poke it in there, and I just I'm like, and it was just a amphitheater of this stuff. So I um I asked her if I could you know get a permitted. We treated it and. I think it spreads rhizonymously mm -hmm. and it well no it like one treatment the whole thing was gone oh, oh, the whole yeah. thing was gone I, I keep on going back every year because it's on a conservation one of our conservation restrictions and when I monitor it I can't find a single re-sprout wow. and so the one in Sheffield was removed and there's one in Lennox and Jane Wynn told me about one in Monterey and she thinks they may have treated that one so there's only a few of these, all right? Mm -hmm. But I'm worried about this plant because it doesn't seem like it's fruiting and spreading by fruit. It seems to be spreading from where it's planted. But that's the exact same thing that the hardy kiwi did for 50, 60, 100 years until it didn't do it anymore and then killed mm -hmm. uh, Kennedy Park, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So, all right. Right here, and it's got these really pretty leaves and these nice flowers. This is why it's planted. Yeah, oh. Right? Aren't they beautiful? Yeah. Yeah. Who wouldn't want that? I want that. Yeah. Look really at that. Chocolate? It may. I don't think so. I don't know. You know the brown flowers. Maybe it's because of the flower. No, no, you know this one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it's yeah. been planted. Um, Ornamentally, uh, not a ton of properties, but it has had some properties where it's been planted ornamentally outside of Boston. Oh, it's okay. brutal to get. I, you know, it's, I don't think it's that sexy because it the flowers are pretty when when they come out, but they don't last long. Okay. So I think it was just one of those things that somebody's like, oh, it's kind of a cool life plant for color. Let's try it. And um, but it is um, at, when I've tried to act as I, I don't, I'm not a big fan of Roundup. I do sure, sure. It organically and um. I have had a hard time getting rid of one plant. Like I've been be, I've been fighting a plant, one plant, um, for ten years or so. Yeah, yeah. So any way you can, right? Like I'm not saying that you bring goats in if you want to have the goat seed. I don't care what. I don't care. I don't. Just as long as you know and you're doing something. Jane doesn't want to use herbicide at Burbank Park. She's got volunteers. She's fighting the fight. That's yeah. great. You know what I mean? We all need to be in on it. So um. But this one, like I had almost two acres of it. Oh. and it's dead. It was wow. gone. The whole thing. The whole thing. I think it just it was all connected. It was I awesome. Think another tree. It was awesome. Mm -hmm. And um, 
You know, this is on private property, but I could I could take it to this property. And I could show you where I put the round up. There's other plants coming back up, so it's like it's a success story in that you know it's not a complete dead zone because I use the herbicide. You know, things are coming back. Um, and that's it. So this is that place in Canaan um, that was going up the trees like this. And then, you know, it's coming up this, these poor little maples are getting beat up. Right. Oh. That's it. Wow. So I'll take any questions if you got them. Here, I'll leave it on still press. I hate that one. <laughs> Are there any animals which uh, eat the Japanese uh, still press? Not that we know of, and not to a point where it has any noticeable effect. So eventually, there are some animals that start to learn, but not fast enough, you know? So, boy, back in the day when I was young in my career, I mean, you guys remember Project Native down in Great Barrington? Yes. They used to have a talk series. And they had a guy, I want to say he was a professor out at some prestigious school out in the Midwest, maybe from Ohio or something like that. He was having his grad, his grad students actually shape the trees of every tree species in around. And he was cataloging the insect species that were, mm -hmm. that were eating the vegetation. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to get it perfect. Like I'm a, I'm kind of a good enough guy. <laughs> so it's going to be close. I don't have my numbers right, but he said something. He goes, the oak. He goes, we sampled the oak, and it was three thousand insect species they had found, right? And then he goes, we sampled uh, black locust, which isn't even from a different continent. It's just from down south. And they're like, we had thirteen. Oh wow. So you know what I mean. So three thousand species versus. 13. So, I mean, that's, I mean, you hear about the apocalypse and in, 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 uh, in the, I, I got to tell you, so in the Berkshires, our, our decline, first of all, it's out on development, right? That's, you know, you're not going to have anything if there's an apartment complex there, right? Or, or, or asphalt, right? Second, probably in South County, the biggest threat to our ecosystem is invasive species. Third is deer. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's how I would rank the threats to our ecosystem right now. Mm -hmm. um, probably up here, a little bit less. You guys, I'd probably put deer in front of invasive species mm -hmm. because you don't have as much as we do yet. But I haven't been all over Williamstown, just a little bit of birding. You guys mm -hmm. had some rough legged hawk stuff, but yeah, the green acres down there. Okay. Oh, cool. Um, what have you been talking about? Going to get worse as it gets warmer up here? Oh, you're talking about global warming? Yeah. 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 I mean, uh, yes, but I don't want to leave you with depression, right? <laughs> so the way the Nature Conservancy thinks about it, I think it's a great way to think about it, right? And especially when I'm talking to a land protection agency like you guys, right? <clears throat> Things are going to change. There's no getting wet around it. But if you protect the stage, the actors will change. But you still got to protect the stage, mm. all right? So are we going to lose abundance in species? Yes, I thought I listened to the Keo Wilson talk mm -hmm. uh, one of the last times he spoke. Uh, and he talks about this bottleneck effect. Have you guys heard this? Haven't speak about this? It's the way he talks about global warming. I think it's great and mass extinction. It's even if we stopped everything right now, we're still heading towards the precipice, right? So it's kind of like a bottleneck, right? And the stewards of the land, it's our job to funnel and keep intact as much as we possibly can so we get to the point where it's wicked bad and then eventually we come off the other side. Oh. So that's, that's the way E.O. Wilson looked at it and I thought it was beautiful because if you don't lose hope mm -hmm. because there has to be another side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. that's the way. I hey, can I add something please? Um, sure. about what you said about the, the oak tree and the, the resilient, yeah, and the yeah, yeah. resilient insects and I apologize if I'm teaching the choir and you guys already know this, but this is one of the things that I heard mm -hmm. a Yukon professor say that just has stuck with me forever. That you know, they breed all of these in our in our residential landscapes. They breed all of these ornamental plants that you can buy 
that are resistant to various fungus and blah, 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 blah. And everybody says, oh, I want one of those. But a lot of times when they breed in a certain kind of hardiness, they breed out mm. the insect and pollinator mm. attractiveness. Mm. So the example that she gave was the um, Cornus Florida, the original mm. Florida dog, mm. which has 430 known pollinators. Wow. And the Cornus Cusa, which they bred because it was anthracnose resistant, has like four. Oh. Wow. So even if you have to tolerate some fungus, some anthracnose, that I've never seen anthracnose actually kill a Florida dogwood. I think that probably the climate change that's going to start happening now. I actually, I, I, the, um, one of the reasons I've retired out here is because I can't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. The last summer kicked my ass in such a part of my French, in such a big way out in Boston. The heat and the drought mm -hmm. was worse than it's ever been. And in the past, Three years, I've sent more um, damaged tree samples for uh, pest and infection ID to the U.S. Um, diagnostics lab than I did in the first 15 years that mm -hmm. I was working as a as a landscaper. And I just thought I could, like I, I I mean I don't want to get everybody depressed either, but I got to say I'm pretty depressed. It's I mean the invasive stuff out here is is I, I didn't I, I've never seen still grass. But the yeah. trees that are dying out east because of the, you know, like the stress from the, the drought and the heat. And then in winter, we get these windstorms. And I, I had one guy who has like a couple acre property who's lost like 10 beautiful pine trees in the last four years because they just keep blowing over. And I've got, I have this big landscape with these, with this gorgeous shade garden under these pine trees. And I'm like, okay, what do I plant now? I can make corn, you know, because it's everything changes. And I, and I, but just the pathogens that I've seen attacking trees that I've never seen before that just scares the crap out. So let me tell you, Paul, because I think it's time. Um, I've been doing it 20 years, and this one beats me up the most. And I lose hope when I go to Mount Washington. But when I was working at the Cobble, do you guys know who Hal Borland was? He's our nature writer. He, used to write, he wrote a ton of books. He used to write for the New York Times. His farm was right over the border in Salisbury, Connecticut. So I picked up a bunch of his books. And he wrote this book called The Book of Days. And it's about his musings and things that are happening on his farm, which is right below our Bounds Cobble. He talked about you know everything from every day, right? 365 Book of Days. So he talks about how the night before an old friend stopped by and he was talking about the ills of the world and he was it was just a, a lot to the point where the next day he put it in his book and i'm going to misquote it because like i said i don't get things perfect it's a gist right um he said something like as i sit out and look out over my farm i know there are hundreds of things wrong with the planet but as I, and then he says, as I sit out and I look out over my farm, I'm reminded that there's still thousands of things that are right. Mm. So even as I we're doing this, like you can still see a bunch of stuff in here that's negative. Mm. You know what I mean? So it's not a complete loss. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And if you want to do some stuff, like each year, you know, me and my wife add to our little garden out front, and we'll go to Whitney's, and she gets to pick one out, and then I get to pick one out. So she'll pick out something that's lovely and beautiful, and I'll look for the thing that's drowning in bees. Mm, yeah. Nice. <laughs> that I don't care what it is. Nice. Do you know what I mean? If it's just that weird little white spiky thing, that's <laughs> the one I pick. So, so that's one thing you can do. There's always something you can do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, oh. anybody else? Uh, Japanese silk grass. I've seen it. You find this picture makes it look like there's other stuff. There's nothing in the other. Stuff. Yeah. It's bad. Yeah. Not if you go down south, yeah, Pennsylvania. Where are you from? Uh, this is New Jersey. Jersey, yeah. Well, no. Yeah. So if you're spraying the silk grass with herbicide, yep, you're killing everything. So all you have is like a mud field no. for like three years. No. no. So grass. things start coming back the next year. But then you have to spray again for the silk grass. true. Yeah. Yeah. So there's what, no easy what's solution. Surviving? Okay. There's no easy solution, okay. but. You know, the hope is that, you know, back out of here out of the range, you have native stuff that'll receive. You know what I mean? So and it, it's just, it's it's what you want to do with your crop rents. Like, 
even this, even in the Niche Conservancy, we never use anything that's not wetland approved. We've been it's in the uplands, mm -hmm. and a lot of the harmful stuff um, is in the surfactants, the stuff that makes us pick the plant. So that's one thing you could use more wetland approved stuff. Just your preference. I know it's a tough topic, and people hate it, and I get it. Like I'd rather not. I don't have a magic wand, and it's just me, you know, fighting, fighting. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Yes, sir. So I have a question. A lot of the properties around here, there's, um, you know, they're owned by various conservation places like the uh, Mountain Mineral Preserve is rural, um, rural land. Um, the Saratini Trail goes to the um, Williams County property and the Massachusetts State Forest. And you can see places where, you know, the, the huge impossible infestation is down here. But then when you look up the slope, there's just you know a few little pioneer bar areas of sure, sure. And so it'd be you know just walk up a handful of those sure. establish the trail boundary. You don't want to get past. But I don't know who, how do you what's your strategy for finding a person in these organizations who's the right person to talk to? Because I feel like if you don't talk to the right person, nothing happens. And it's true, and it's also with every organization's capacity. Yeah. So if you find a place that you love mm -hmm. you're walking through there, I'm not saying pull it. Yeah. I'm not saying just pull it out. Yeah. I wouldn't advocate you just yeah. going in there and pulling it out. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. No, I do. You got that on the other side. That's I you know, a big area and just say, yeah, yeah. So for me, and maybe one other guy, I'd pull all this stuff out in two days. Well, what you're saying is this right here. They want to see property and pull out your yeah. yeah. line all over the place. So how yeah. do you, who do you talk to and how do you get going? That's so not that. I don't have an easy I don't have an easy answer for you. Okay. But I will tell you, but you did touch on something I want to talk about this management, right? So when I first started that, my natural, my my, nat my first natural inclination at the Cabo was to go to the most heavily infested area first. Mm -hmm. You go to the place that's not infested. So when you were saying these pioneer plants, mm -hmm. those are the ones that need to come on, right? So now with the Nature Conservancy, we look at places that aren't heavily infested mm -hmm. or around rare species. Like I'm, I'm using this stuff like next to some some plant species I use this next to sitting next to the half a handful but in the vicinity they're the only populations in the entire state wow. and so I, I i do this in some really sensitive habitats but that's what i would do like if this is a place that's beloved mm -hmm. and if, if it was something on the outskirts nobody's gonna yell at you for ripping up a barberry plant i pull garlic mustard all the time <laughs> throw it in the road it's it's it. yeah. <laughs> little little oh, i know it's the best little oriental bitter sweets <laughs> I, I marked some bases for the New York New Jersey Scale Conference. Okay. With, and I've used several apps. And you know, you go to areas that the friend and I would be on the trail and give you such a trail. You go, yeah, there's some here, there's some there, there's a bunch here. Forget that area, it looks like a like an illness, you know. Uh -huh. But then they go back, another person comes back on another day and they pull the areas. Leading up to that, so that you, you keep it from going that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, uh, in several area groups I've worked with, um, there's a, there's a project called Clean Clay Go, and I I I see the way people walk up here. You ought to be stepping on something and cleaning your shoes off mm -hmm. before you go up your trail, because at the trailheads mm -hmm. is where everybody they bring it from their car. They they've been someplace else. Whatever mm -hmm. they got there, they have on their feet and they're taking it up. To your lovely, hopefully pristine area. I just thought uh, I was supposed to be on uh, BTC. Um, hopefully, I'll be giving a talk to them about Japanese still grass. So, you're talking about, you know, bridge runners coming across the application trail. That's a big thing. Yeah. So, just just knowing what Japanese still grass looks like to have the battle, it's yeah. a grass. Yeah, yeah. It's not it's like a <laughs> so primrose. That thing's easy to identify. Yeah. Or a honey stuff or bush or something. So um, the more people that know there. Anybody online with a question? I have one one request that you repeat the name of the book by the New York Times nature writer. Oh, Hal Borland, Book of Days. It was the book of days. It's great. He's, he he writes a lot of great stuff. Hal Borland. Anything else? And like I said, I think I got some cards in my bag. If you guys want my cards, um, yeah. my email's on there. 
if you photograph something you want me i i, I did this all the time and that i can an idea um you know yeah okay. i'm more than happy to help out i can Thanks, Rennie. Thank you. Great. Thank wow. You so yeah, thank you. So I want to say not only thank you to Rennie for giving us this great talk, um, but also thank you to you all for attending both here at Sheep Hill and online. I um, hope you all feel a little bit ready to tackle some invasives and not totally depressed and overwhelmed. Um, but we want you also to keep an eye out this summer this invasive species is something that we're starting to think about at Sheep Hill and we're kind of interested in tackling. So look for more kind of invasive themed events coming. Um, lastly, um, we're a member supported organization. So if you enjoyed this free talk and want to support others, then please consider joining or donating to our organization. Um, and then I just wanted to plug, we have three events coming up. Um, so we, if you're interested in environmental topics and conservation topics, we do have a book group that meets um, I know that book groups are intimidating. You do not need to read the entire book in order to come. Um, this, uh, we're meeting February 6th at 6 p.m. here, and we're discussing a book called Fresh Banana Leaves by Dr. Jessica Hernandez, and it's about indigenous exclusion from conservation conversations and practices. Um, also, next Saturday on the 18th at 11, I'll be leading an interpretive hike at the Chestnut Trail. Um, and we'll be talking about land use changes and the plight of the American chestnut if you want to talk about more invasive yeah. <laughs> invasive diseases yeah. this time. Um, <laughs> and then lastly, our next Knowing Your Landscape talk will be on March 7th at 7 p.m. Um, we'll be joined by the Mass Wildlife Habitat Biologist and some Biomap Outreach Specialists. And they'll just be discussing the features of the newly enhanced Biomap, which is a map that's been put together by Mass Wildlife to identify priority habitats. Um, as well as species of greatest conservation concern in the Berkshires and resources available to private landowners for planning and funding habitat management. Awesome. Um, you can sign up for these and our other events on our website at ruralands.org events. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you, Dana. All right. Thank you.